Hi folks, Joseph Kursky here with you to talk about teaching boring topics in geography in an engaging way. Now let me say at the outset that I don't consider any of these topics boring at all. I think they're all of critical importance and students need to understand these foundations. However, I do recognize that there is a certain way of teaching them that is more engaging than others. And I'd like to challenge you with using some of these ways that I outline and I also look forward to hearing your feedback in terms of what your ideas are. Now this classic photograph that I have here is one of those where you know students are actually lecturing to other students and I want to get you away from just teaching about these topics in that sort of sage on the stage you as the authority on all of these topics. Yes you are knowledgeable about these topics but get the students engaged in these topics in the following ways. As I say that I would like to just indicate to you all that this is my contact information right here. Feel free to get a hold of me at any time. I am here to serve and I again look forward to your feedback. Alright, so let's begin. Active hands-on instruction using web mapping tools can help engage students in grasping fundamental geographic concepts of scale, resolution, spatial representation, data quality, data collection, and map updates, and much more. So let's talk about scale for a moment. One way to teach about this is use USGS topographic maps inside ArcGIS Online at different scales. For example, 1 to 250,000, relatively medium slash small scale, lot of area, not much detail, 1 to 100,000, more detail, a little bit larger scale, and 1 to 24,000, largest scale of the three, more detail, less area per map. So for example, if we pull up this particular map which I have embedded right here from ArcGIS Online. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, as we do that we see Bismarck, North Dakota as you can see right here in the center of the map image. And this is at 1 to 250,000 scale. So you can see that some of the section line roads are there, some of the roads inside Bismarck and Mandan are there, but they're largely yellowed out. They are urban areas. You don't see individual streets. But as we zoom in the ArcGIS Online is going to switch to now 1 to 100,000 scale and now you're going to see a bit more detail. Also of interest here, uh, as an aside, but not too aside because it's still about teaching geography, but is looking at uh, change over time because the 1 to 250,000 scale maps were mostly made in the 1970s. The 1 to 100,000 scale maps, as we're looking at here, were mostly made in the 1980s. And the 1 to 24,000 scale maps that we're going to look at in a bit are made from the 1950s to about 2010-ish. So you've got a wide expanse of, of years there. You can also use the USGS Historical Topographic Map Viewer to look at changes over time. But that's a separate video that I encourage you to watch. The 1 to 100,000 scales made in the 1980s are metric units. So the elevations are different from the 1 to 250,000 scale and the 1 to 24,000 scale. So it's something to keep in mind. As we zoom in one more time, now we're going to start seeing the 1 to 24,000 scale map show up as you can see right here. So now you can see 1 to 24,000 scale. You've got individual buildings in certain areas. You can also see this purple revision which again talking about change over time shows the update and you can get the dates for the the revisions made from the pink urban area perhaps from the 1960s, the purple revisions perhaps from the 1980s. So the point is, show different scales inside ArcGIS Online. Easy to do with ArcGIS.com. Let's move on, folks. Resolution. How do you teach about resolution? Well, for example, you could use the Change Matters Viewer. The Change Matters Viewer shows different satellite images over time and space. But another thing that's interesting about that is you can also teach about resolution using the Change Matters Viewer. For example, these 1970 images, for example, Mount St. Helens, they are with 60 meter resolution imagery. The 2000 image that we have right here, and you can change the date as well, is from 30 and sometimes enhanced thematic mapper 15 meter cells. So you can see right away here that you've got some blurriness at, in 1975 because you've got the multispectral scanner at that time 60 meters spatial resolution and the 2000 image is at 
30, and sometimes 15 meter resolution. So that is a way for you to teach about resolution using that Change Matters viewer. Maps are representations of reality. They are not reality. We love maps. They're very useful for education, research, and much more, but they are only representations of reality. So take a look at this uh, map here, and as I point up here to northern Wisconsin, see how you've got the deciduous changing central hardwoods, in this case, changing to the northern and western coniferous right there, and also mixed. You've got a mixed zone. Now, on maps like this, it's shown as a as a line, isn't it? But if I, I'd just like to challenge you, take a look at my video at some point because this video talks about me being on the deciduous coniferous line in northern Wisconsin. And you can see from the terrain that I'm walking around in that it's really not a line at all. It's a zone. It's a zone. It's a, it's a, it's a band. So at certain points, it might be 90% uh, deciduous and a little bit north there might be 80% coniferous, uh, deciduous, a little bit north of there, 70% deciduous, and so, and so on. Take a look at that video sometime. And so one of the themes running through our book, The GIS Guide to Public Domain Data, which I'll show you the cover of right here from Esri Press, is that maps are representations of reality. While almost everyone is likely to agree with this statement, in the fast-paced world that GIS analysis and creating maps has become, it is easy to lose sight of this fact when staring at tables, maps, and imagery. Right, folks? So the video that I made that I just showed you briefly, observe my surroundings as I stand near the traditional line that divides the deciduous forest in the south from the coniferous forest in the north in North America. So is the line really a line at all? Or better described as a gradual change from, from deciduous in the south to coniferous as one travels north? Is that vector line then better represented as a zone? Or is vegetation better mapped perhaps as a raster data set with each cell representing this, this percentage of deciduous and coniferous trees? So how many other data sets do we tend to see as having firm boundaries, but when the boundaries are not really firm at all in reality, how does that affect the, the decisions that we make with them? So even the boundary between wetlands and open water were originally interpreted based on land cover data or a satellite or aerial image. Even contour lines, folks, were often interpreted originally from aerial st stereo pairs. And each data set was collected at a specific scale with certain equipment and with certain software at a specific date and within certain margins of error as that organization had established them. So maps are representations of reality. They are incredibly useful representations to be sure, but care needs to be taken when using this or any abstracted data. So as you, for example, look at this particular topographic map, today while GIS tools allow us to zoom in to very large scales, the data that you are examining might have been collected at a much smaller scale. So just because you can zoom in doesn't mean the resolution changes. I know that's easy for us to sort of comprehend, but as you're zooming in and out, it's easy for students and many of us to get this idea that as I zoom in, the resolution is getting better and better, and therefore the, uh, the, the data is getting more and more accurate. Not necessarily the case, probably most often not the case. So if you're making decisions at, let's say, 1 to 10,000 scale, and your base data was collected at 1 to 50,000 scale, you're treading on dangerous ground, or one could say you're walking on water. More about that in a minute. So some data, such as USGS digital line graphs, originally came from cartographic products like that topographic map that you can see right here. Cartographic products were sometimes created according to national map accuracy standards, but in the case of USGS topographic maps, roads were often offset from railroads if they appeared too closely on the final to topographic product so that the map reader could easily distinguish between these at a certain scale, 1 to 24,000 in this case. As a result, the position of the road is inaccurate on the resulting digital line graph. Scale matters, and again, the source matters. So for example, in this area right here in western Colorado, the railroad had precedence. The road was actually offset so that you could actually easily distinguish the road from the railroad because as it truly is on the ground and represented on this map, if the map were a geographic rather than cartographic product, that railroad and road would be really, really close together. It'd be hard for your eyes to distinguish between the two. So it was offset so to improve the legibility of the cartographic product, in this case, the map. Take a look at this. This shows a track around a reservoir that I took. There's a certain piece of it off to the north here that's actually not on the reservoir boundary, which is actually where I walked. So data quality. Be critical of your data even it was when it is your own. Let's go ahead and zoom in here. As we do that, you can see the time and date that I actually walked. And the first point is actually out here. Then it goes off to the north and so on and so forth. 
and then back it finally snaps onto the reservoir boundary. Thanks to mobile technologies, anyone can create spatial data, even from a smartphone as I did here, and upload it into the GIS cloud for anyone to use. This has led to incredibly useful collaborations such as OpenStreetMap, crowdsourced street map of the world. But in this case, I want you to think about, about these uh, cautions. The ease of data creation means that caution must be employed more than ever before. For example, this map that I'm showing you using Motion X GPS on an iPhone and map using ArcGIS Online that follows my track around this particular reservoir. Let's zoom out a little bit so we can see the whole thing. So now you can see the whole thing. This map was symbolized at the time of GPS collection from yellow to gradually darker blue dots as time passed, as you can see here. So the yellow was the first and then darker blue as I kept walking around. So the point is, is that I did not walk across these fields, these lots, these houses. It took a while for the GPS to snap on to the fact that I was actually walking around the reservoir boundary. Scale and resolution matter. Why did it not know my correct position? Well, when I first started, first fired up the GPS, it had to figure out, okay, Joseph's in North America somewhere. Oh, Joseph's in Colorado somewhere. Okay, Joseph's is close to this reservoir. Ah, now I can see that Joseph is actually right on the reservoir uh, periphery, a uh, peripheral path. So it's something to keep in mind. You got to be critical of the data, even if you're collecting it yourself. Number five, data quality. Be critical of the devices and apps you're using. So comparing the spatial accuracy, for example, of two location apps on a smartphone in the field. So building on past field investigations where I've written about the spatial accuracy of GPS receivers and smartphone location apps, I recently compared the spatial accuracy of two location apps on a smartphone. My goals were twofold. One, to determine which of the two location apps was more spatially accurate in varied terrain and conditions, and number two, to model a field activity that integrates geography, science, and mathematics that students can engage in easily and effectively. So as you can see here, here's my live web map, and I'm going to look at that. I'm going to turn on the, the, the data sets inside there. All right, so take a look at this. This is my track as I hiked up this very steep ridge in Southern California. Here's my track from a RunKeeper Fitness app going up and down the trail. You can see that it's significantly offset. This was at, on the way up, it's actually fine, but on the way down, it was compromised. Why? Well, a variety of reasons. That very steep ridge off to the west of me could have been blocking some GPS signal. And then I also compared it to a Motion X GPS app. Let's compare that. You can see that in some cases the fitness app was actually better. For example, right here, the fitness app in blue captures my curving around that corner, whereas it was that point was not dropped on the Motion X track, but on the other hand, over here, the Motion X track was actually better because it was spot on right on the trail uh, as shown on the satellite image. But remember, the satellite image is also imperfect. So don't think that when you're talking about this that the satellite image is, is the absolute truth. It, it too has been manipulated and, and so on. So the deeper you go, the more interesting discussions you can have. But let's keep it fairly light and simple for the moment. Then I've also got a CSV from an actual Garmin GPS, which are these points right here. And you can see here, this was on a different date entirely, quite a bit of offset. Interesting, isn't it? That the different apps matter, and the different time of day matters, and the terrain matters. Again, teaching about these concepts, you can do with these real live examples, for example, inside ArcGIS Online. Now, another one, be critical of the data. Collection methods, the data collection methods actually matter. So this is a rather grim photo. This is actually a, a photo of someone's Lyme disease limb. Okay, so you've got that bullseye sort of marking there, which is kind of a sad thing and a grim thing. Um, one of my neighbors actually had Lyme disease and had to quit work. I mean, it's a very serious thing. So my colleague Lynn Malone and I have been teaching workshops using Lyme disease case counts from 1992 to 1998 by town in the state of Rhode Island for several years. Most recently, we started with an Excel spreadsheet and used ESRI Maps for Office to map and publish the data to ArcGIS Online. The results are here. So again, ESRI Maps for Office, Microsoft Office, very easy to map your spreadsheets. And we've got some data here that we can analyze. So higher incidences, darker. So this was the worst town in terms of Lyme disease. 1998, okay, but the plot thickens. 
After one of the workshops, we sought to update the data with information from 1999 to the present. So we contacted the Rhode Island Department of Health. They not only provided the data, they also provided valuable information about the data. The public health staff told us that the Lyme disease surveillance is time and resource intensive. Okay, during the 1980s and 1990s, as funding and human resource capacity allowed, the state ramped up surveillance activities, including robust outreach to healthcare providers. Prioritizing Lyme surveillance allowed the state to obtain detailed clinical information for a large number of cases and classify them appropriately. The decrease observed in the 2004-2005 case counts was due to personnel changes and a shift in strategy for Lyme surveillance. Resource and priority changes reduced their active provider follow-up. As a result, in the years since 2004, the state has been reporting fewer cases than in the past. They believe this decrease in cases is a result of changes due to surveillance activities and not to a change in the incidence of disease in Rhode Island. Now, folks, if this isn't the perfect example of know your data, I don't know what is. If one didn't know that the surveillance activities had changed, an erroneous conclusion about the spatial and temporal patterns of Lyme disease would surely have occurred. And often this kind of information doesn't make it into standard metadata forms. This is also a reminder of that, hey, contacting the data provider is often the most helpful way of obtaining the inside scoop on how the data was gathered, even though it sounds so 20th century to actually contact the data provider on a phone or an email. And you can bet that we made sure this information was included in the metadata when we served this updated information. Another example of teaching boring topics in geography in a lively way. Maps change or walking on the water. Hmm. After my day at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presentations for GIS Day, being a geographer, I took the opportunity to get out under the landscape as you would have done. I walked on the Lake Michigan Pier at Manitowoc, enjoying a walk in the brisk wind to and from the lighthouse, recording my track on my smartphone in a fitness application called RunKeeper. When my track ended on the resulting map, it appeared as though I was walking on the water, as you can see here. Hmm. Funny, I don't recall even getting wet. It all comes down to paying close attention to your data and knowing its sources, which should lead to a larger discussion on the importance of scale and resolution in any project involving maps or GIS. In my case, even if I chose a larger scale, the peer did not appear on the RunKeeper application's base map in 2012. It does now, however, and it also appears on the base map in ArcGIS Online. So base maps have improved. Most of the GIS literature understandably focuses on the success stories, but if you dig a bit, you can find examples where neglecting these important concepts have not only led to bad decisions, but have also cost people their property and sometimes even their lives. Precision matters. Accuracy is the degree or closeness to which the information on a map matches values in the real world. Accuracy refers to the quality of data and the number of errors contained in a certain data set. In GIS data, Accuracy can refer to a geographic position, or to an attribute, or to a conceptual accuracy. Precision, on the other hand, refers to how exact the description of data is. Precise data may be inaccurate, because it may be exactly described, but inaccurately gathered. Perhaps the surveyor made a mistake, or the data was recorded wrongly into the database. So this bullseye with these dots, A, B, clustered but off the target, C, sort of centered on the target, but sort of dispersed, and D, dispersed, but not on the target. The crosshair of each image represents the true value of the entity, and the red dots represent the measure values. Image A is precise and accurate. Image A, precise and accurate. Image B, precise, but not accurate. There's image B. What about image C? What's your guess? Yep, it's accurate, but imprecise, okay? And image D, that is neither accurate nor precise. Understanding both accuracy and precision is important for assessing the usability of a GIS data set. When a data set is inaccurate but highly precise, corrective measures can be taken to adjust the data set to make it more accurate. So let's take a look at this. This is a great way of teaching this, uh, this concept. Measure distances between these points on this web map. Why these points and not others? Well, these points are the following. If you had a data measurement that your students had gathered or you gathered, and it was 34.056294 minus 117.195796, and you said, or your student said, hey, could we just round? Could we shave off some decimals or round? Well, 
okay, let's try it and see how the position changes based on that. So for example, if you map 34 minus 117 inside RTIS Online, so 34, 117, that is over here, friends. That is right here at this position, okay? The, the, the one that I wanted you to look at first is this one, 34.056, etc., etc. And that is actually right here on the S3 campus. So that's the position right there. If we shaved off a decimal point, well, a, a significant digit, then we're over here. If we shave off two, we're over here. Again, it depends on your needs, but let's just go ahead and measure this in uh, meters. So from this point over to this point, we're talking about 80 some meters. But if we scroll out a bit to this next point, now we're in the hundreds of meters, almost a kilometer. This is shaving off yet again. So in this case, that is 117.19, 34.05. If we shave off one more, then we're down here. 117.134. If we shave off one more off each of those, we're at 34, 117, which is right here. So the point is, is that you can use these tools quite easily and effectively to teach about precision and accuracy. So conclusion, as cloud-based geotechnologies continue to evolve and as geo-awareness increases in society, these concepts are becoming increasingly important. Would you agree? Active hands-on instruction, yes, are becoming increasingly important. And you can use web mapping tools to help students engage in grasping these fundamental concepts in geography. No longer boring, right? GIS and Public Domain Data is a book that you might uh, be interested in after this discussion because it is all about what we've been talking about. Data quality, precision, accuracy, etc. And related data issues like crowdsourcing, privacy, and so on. It's called the GIS Guide to Public Domain Data and the blog that we update weekly and we have done so for the last five years, is called Spatial Reserves. Spatial Reserves. Let's check that out for a moment. Spatialreserves.wordpress.com Also, folks, on a related note, see my article in Directions Magazine, Why Data Quality Matters Now More Than Ever. Why Data Quality Matters Now More Than Ever. That wraps up our discussion for now about teaching boring geography concepts in an engaging way, again, using these powerful web mapping tools, for example, ArcGIS Online. Keep in touch. Here are ways to get a hold of me on LinkedIn, uh, the geospatial data blog that I mentioned just a bit ago, daily geo-related posts on my Twitter feed, GIS and education blog, and over 3,000 geo-related videos. Thank you very much, and look forward to hearing how you teach these, what I called, boring topics in geography in an engaging way. Thanks.